What is grief if not love persevering? This one line has absolutely defined the concept behind Marvel Studios' riskiest venture. The story of Wanda Maximoff creating a whole new reality in Westview, New Jersey, seemed like an odd and relatively unfilmable concept at first, but even to my own surprise, it has grown to become the most popular show on the planet at this moment in time at least. And as we get ready to celebrate the finale, whether it's the season or of the series, we don't quite know yet. But as we get ready to celebrate this massive accomplishment, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the show and how it manifested itself into existence. When I call WandaVision Kevin Feige's riskiest venture, I do mean it. Since 2008, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has resided solely in theaters, 23 films, and nearly $23 billion in worldwide revenue. It seemed like a gamble to move the franchise over to the small screen. And look, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, hey Matt, what about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Agent Carter, Daredevil, and the rest of the Marvel Netflix shows, never mind the Marvel Hulu shows? And while they do exist, and in many cases run parallel to the greater MCU, it's because of the divide between Kevin Feige and Ike Pulmeter in Marvel Television that they haven't quite been on the same page. But all of this changed in October 2019 when it was announced that Marvel Television would be going defunct and rolling into Marvel Studios. All of this under the purview of Kevin Feige. This was a major shakeup at the company and one that made total sense. The divide between Kevin Feige and Ike Pulmeter went back years. When Marvel Studios was formed and started making a name for themselves, Ike Pulmeter was in control of the Marvel company, and he is a notorious cheap ass. Even after Disney bought Marvel, the pecking order continued and a huge rift was formed during the development of Captain America's Civil War. Look, I'm sure they hated each other for a while, but eventually Feige had enough and he threatened to quit unless Bob Iger did something. Iger, not one to screw over his golden goose, stepped in and allowed Feige to break free from Perlmutter. Then, four years later, Feige took over everything. This move was championed by fans, and not one person felt sad for Ike Pulmutter. Which is fine, because if he would have remained in charge, the MCU would have grown very stagnant and probably died on the vine. Let me give you one prime example as to why I think I'm right with my assessment here. In 2014, Kevin Feige announced the Inhumans movie. Ike Pulmeter stepped in and grabbed the idea and brought it over to ABC in the form of a terrible television series. I'll have to ultimately do a patio commentary about that show one day, but trust me when I say that it was a mess. When Disney announced their plans to create Disney Plus and that they wanted Marvel content for the streaming service, just imagine what would have happened if Ike Pulmeter, Jeff Loeb, and the last regime at Marvel Television would have still been in control. Would it be as great as WandaVision? Hell no. And you guys know that I'm right on that one. Now, Disney had announced at the end of 2017 that they were developing a streaming service after turning down the option to purchase Twitter. And no, I'm not kidding about that. And by September 2018, Marvel Studios was hard at work developing several series for their parent company. The series were all originally planned as limited series that would center on supporting characters who hadn't starred in their own movies yet. Actors in those roles were expected to reprise those characters for these series as well, and that each one would have a motion picture-sized budget and run in conjunction with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. This was great because as fans of Marvel television, we had been wanting this canonical overlap with the MCU since 2013 when Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. first premiered. And you have to keep in mind that back at the beginning of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., the shows did overlap with the Marvel movies somewhat. But after the split between Feige and Perlmutter in 2015, it essentially became the multiverse without calling itself the multiverse. Fans were obviously annoyed with this, but stuck with it because the good did, in fact, outweigh the bad. For these Disney Plus shows, they would all be produced by Marvel Studios and not Marvel Television, and this was actually a whole year before the aforementioned closing of Marvel Television, and they would be between about six and eight episodes each. Kevin Feige, just like with the movies, would take a hands-on approach in the development of these shows. His focus, however, was clearly the continuity of story 
and handling the actors. I'd like to take a quick moment here and talk about why the continuity of story element is so important. Outside of the great casting for the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the chapter-based approach to storytelling is the key reason why the MCU has only grown in popularity and become the brand that it is. Moving that element from the big screen to the small screen is not the easiest task, and seeing how Feige wanted to tackle that responsibility himself shows his dedication to the project, and quite frankly, it shows. Originally, it seemed that the show was going to focus on Wanda Maximoff herself, but not so much Vision. Then in the fall of 2018, Infinity War had come out, and Vision was dead in the continuity. Bringing him back to life probably wasn't on the docket originally, but by October 2018, Paul Bettany's vision was revived and the show could focus on their relationship following the snap, or blip, or whatever you want to call it. Granted though, at the same time, Wanda was also killed, so they had to keep the whole show under wraps as to not give away the ending of Avengers Endgame which we all knew was coming, but you know, Marvel still loves to keep obvious surprises. Well, surprises. And the name for the series did in fact jump around a little bit. At one point it was called Vision and the Scarlet Witch, and then it was the Vision and Scarlet Witch, but eventually Feige suggested WandaVision off the top of his head. The showrunner Jack Schaefer loved it, and she insisted that they keep it despite the silliness of the name. Schaefer believed that audiences would get on board after seeing the show. Honestly, I never really saw much backlash to the title of the show at all. The only real complaint or criticism that I saw was about how it would work and how it would tie into Phase 4. The show was always going to have ramifications for Phase 4, but it was not meant to kick it off. The show was going to come out in 2020 but the launch of Phase 4 was supposed to be with Black Widow. However, no one predicted the coronavirus pandemic, so that pressure was put on WandaVision. And I have to say, it's for the best. Look, there was no MCU content in 2020, and to see Phase 4's new launch become the most popular show in the world in just a few weeks is a testament to the longevity and loyalty to the Marvel Cinematic Universe and to the dedication of Kevin Feige. The show was originally pitched as having just nine episodes, with only the first three fitting into the 30-minute sitcom runtime. After that, they were going to have varying lengths. While it's true that the lengths of the episodes do vary, it does feel like the end credits are a solid amount of the runtime, and many of the show's critics try to accuse Marvel of padding the content with longer end credits. I mean, it's an absurd claim overall, and it goes to show you just how far some people will go to dump on it because it's popular in some circles. The rest of us just think those people are dumbasses. Now, what's great about the show is how it goes through the different decades, and it pays homage to the shows that dominated that time period. From the first episode drawing influence from the Dick Van Dyke show, to Bewitched in the 1960s, to The Brady Bunch in the 1970s, to Full House, Family Ties, and Roseanne in the 1980s, to hell, even Malcolm in the Middle for the 1990s and 2000s, and finishing up with The Office, Parks and Rec, and Modern Family for the 2010s. Even the Agatha After All song was heavily inspired by the Munsters theme song, and if I'm not mistaken, a little bit of Adam's Family as well. And when it comes to the music, while Christoph Beck has done a good job composing the score for the show, just like he did with Ant-Man and Ant-Man and the Wasp, the real MVPs for the show is Robert Lopez and Kristen Anderson Lopez and what they brought to the table. These are Disney's go-to for music, it seems, because they're the reason why all the parents out there know Let It Go from Frozen. But all of us nerds out there should know them as the creators of the song The Internet Is For Porn from the amazing musical Avenue Q. Now, one of the central elements to the show's success is clearly the casting. Jack Schaefer did a great job in bringing back not only Jimmy Woo, but Darcy Lewis as well, which really speaks to the core idea of bringing these shows to Disney+. If the idea was to highlight smaller characters and give them more screen time, this has certainly done that. Hell, Jimmy Woo has gotten so popular that one guy on Twitter made a joke about a Jimmy Woo X-Files type show set within the MCU, and it got so much attention that apparently he got a call about making a pitch for the show. Granted, this could all be made up crap, 
but the love for Jimmy Woo is undeniable. Kat Denning's Darcy Lewis has gotten some newfound love too. I've always enjoyed seeing her in the Thor movies, and that's mostly because I've had a wee crush on her ever since 2005's The 40-Year-Old Virgin, but her role in the MCU has always felt small to me. Here, she gets some good moments to shine, and I hope that this shows that even the smaller characters can steal the spotlight with enough good source material. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Tiana Paris as Monica Rambeau. Her acting has just been amazing in the series so far, and I can't wait to see her conflict with Carol Danvers in Captain Marvel 2. I say this because the first Captain Marvel movie was the lowest stakes MCU movie yet, because at no point was Carol Danvers in any real danger. However, clearly Monica harbors some resentment towards Danvers, and that tension will be good to see play out in the sequel. I wasn't a Captain Marvel fan at all, but I'm all for character progression and growth. Now, one of the funnier casting choices for me was actually Deborah Jo Rupp showing up as a Kitty Foreman type character in the first episode. Having watched all the seasons of that 70s show, there'd be no way to see her as anyone else other than Kitty Foreman even playing Mrs. Hart. And she nailed it. But really, the big one is Evan Peters as fake Pietro. And this to me was just the icing of the cake when it comes to the casting of the show. We all knew that he had been cast in the show when it was scooped in June of 2020. Many people believed that he was playing Mephisto as there was no way he'd be back as Pietro Maximoff from the Fox universe. But when that turned out to be all wrong, it completely took the internet by surprise and showed us that Marvel knew exactly what it was doing with the show. One thing that I've noticed that doesn't get a lot of love is just how Matt Shackman directed all of the episodes of the series. The show often switches ratio perspectives when it's both inside and outside of the hex. This was a fantastic way to showcase the switching between realities in the show, and I feel like they did a great job at mimicking the 4x3 ratio that old school sitcoms used before moving to the standard 16x9 that we are used to today. But the lakes they went through to recreate the idea of the Dick Van Dyke show was pretty great too. The first three episodes of the show, which took place entirely in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, respectively, were actually filmed over the span of just three days with an actual live studio audience to get the laughs without needing a laugh track. But some episodes were not recorded in front of a live studio audience, and they did in fact use laugh tracks. The production team used a sound expert to figure out how those laugh tracks have changed over time. What's really interesting about this is that it disproves an old myth about laugh tracks. So here's the thing. When I was in film school, I had heard that laugh tracks were all recorded back in the 1950s or 1960s. And that, let's say, these chuckles and guffaws that we heard in the Big Bang Theory were actually from people who were probably already dead, which kind of makes sense when you think about the comedy in the Big Bang Theory and who their target audience is. However, the show also worked with the dialect coach to teach the actors how to walk, talk, and act like they were filming a sitcom from each era the show took place in. This was absolutely noticeable in my opinion because it felt like we were watching a sitcom that would have been made a half decade ago. It invoked all of those emotions and memories from when I was a kid growing up with these kind of shows. I'm not the only one either. Many people who were skeptical of the show's premise found themselves transported back to the golden age of sitcoms, and it immediately created a bond with the series. Now, the series itself was filmed in Atlanta between December 2019 and February 2020. Then, of course, the pandemic hit, and it caused production to be shut down for a few months before the reshoots could happen. During this time, though, Matt Shackman was able to go back to the editing room and really polish what he had already filmed. This allowed him to see things from a different perspective and approach things in a new and different way. But none of it altered the creativity of the show. I mean, this isn't like Justice League from 2017, but we're going to talk more about that in a couple weeks. After the shutdown, the production was then moved from Atlanta back to LA for reshoots with a very rigorous COVID-19 safety protocol in place. Both Olsen and Bettany had issues with this, but for actually different reasons. Elizabeth Olsen had trouble getting back into the groove of things after such a long shutdown. Keep in mind, 
that they were supposed to resume filming on March 14th, 2020, but didn't actually get back to work until September 2020. Paul Bettany just hated the safety protocols for the coronavirus, and this wasn't because he's some kind of anti-masker or COVID truth or anything like that, but a lot of the camaraderie and the collaborative creativity comes from what happens on set in between takes. Part of the new regulations was that the cast had to return to their trailers when not filming. That can make anyone feel a bit isolated when you're supposed to be working with a team to finish a project. The filming for WandaVision finally was completed in mid-November 2020. It's now March 2021, so mid-November was only a few months ago, and the show premiered on January 15th, 2021. That's two months after they wrapped production that the show was able to drop on Disney+. Plus. How did this happen, you might ask? Well, Matt Shackman credits the shutdown for being able to get most of the post-production work done, and it absolutely shows how much work went into this show in regards to its visual effects, both practical and digital. Hell, Paul Bettany thinks that there were more visual effects shots in WandaVision than Avengers Endgame, but we're just gonna have to take his word for that one. Kevin Feige, though, has admitted that the show was built for the week-to-week -week release model so that audiences would have to try to guess what happens next, to have a week to speculate or rewatch and build that anticipation. And the truth of the matter is, it worked. I mean, people developed their own theories and their own approaches to certain characters, and they had their heart set on certain aeronautical engineers being certain characters from the Marvel Universe. And when that didn't happen, a lot of people got really mad because they built up their expectations and didn't modify them accordingly. This also happened with The Mandalorian 2, which is, I think, one of the reasons why Disney is sticking with the week-to-week -week model. I've often been a person who argues against binge culture, so we don't plow through everything so fast. I say this because Netflix has changed the game on that front, and the detrimental side of it has shown itself during the pandemic. However, in this case, Feige did say that the show was also something that you could have a blast with, with binging all the episodes after they were out. I can honestly attest to that as well. My girlfriend didn't have any interest in seeing the show at first, but I finally talked her into watching it after episode six dropped. She watched through it all in an evening and was desperate for more. A lot of the audience is in the same boat too, and I think I figured out why. The show touched on the issue surrounding grief during a time when over 2.5 million people worldwide have passed away from a deadly pandemic. We have spent the last year in one form of a lockdown or another, and to see a Marvel Studios project tackle grief in this way is, well, cathartic. You may not feel the way I do, but I like the fact that we are in a space where people are having more open talks about how they grieve. Mental health is a massive issue plaguing our society, and grief management is a big part of fixing that. Just the fact that a show like this is taking it head on with characters we care about helps, and I personally thank them for that. In just a few short weeks, WandaVision has become the most popular show on the planet. People love it. People love going back to these sitcoms and playing within these tropes and using it to advance the narrative from within the hex. And as a person who grew up in the 80s and 90s, it was great seeing all of these shows get the Marvel treatment. The question then becomes, what about a sequel? Is the final episode the end of the season or the series? We honestly don't know yet. I know that the idea of these MCU Disney Plus shows was that they were meant to be a limited series, but some shows will be coming back, according to Kevin Feige. We just don't know which ones yet. Looking at the future of these characters, clearly Wanda Maximoff is going to play a large part of Phase 4 by appearing in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, and the ending of WandaVision will definitely play into that, as I'm sure it will also play into the events of Spider-Man No Way Home and it will probably impact Marvel Studios opening up the multiverse. As a quick side note, I am writing and recording this before the WandaVision finale, so I could be entirely wrong here in my prediction. However, Marvel and Disney are in the business of making money. They know what audiences want and how to give it to them in new and fresh ways. If the popularity for WandaVision stays high, then you can bet your ass that we'll see these characters again. 
I don't know when or how, but I do know to never bet against Kevin Feige to give you what you want in a unique fashion. As I bring this episode to a close, I do love the show. I think it's fantastic. I can't wait to see what happens with it and the future of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I look forward to more fan theories and more people's breakdowns of everything because there's so much fun to watch. This show has been cathartic for me and many other people. And again, I do want to thank Marvel and Kevin Feige and Jack Schaefer and Elizabeth Olsen and Paul Bettany and the whole team for making that a reality. Remember guys, we're in this for the long haul. So do what you love, enjoy what you can and try to be as happy as possible. And there's nothing wrong with feeling pain and there's nothing wrong with expressing grief because that's how you heal. And that's how I view this show as semi healing. I know that's weird to say, but that's how I view it. And as always, I want to hear what you guys have to say about this. If you're listening to this on YouTube, please do me a favor and leave a like. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. If you're listening to this on podcasts, please go to iTunes and leave a review. That would be wonderful. I'll talk to you guys next week. Have yourself a great day. Thank you for watching and peace out.